Good evening. I would like to repeat this, that the goal of our work, that which we ultimately must attain, is the actual awareness, the actual experience experience of the presence of God. God is omnipresence, that is, God is here where I am, God is here where you are, God is there where they are, God is everywhere. This is the meaning of omnipresence, all presence. And if you were to look out at this world, you would hardly believe it. If you were to read the newspapers, if you were to notice the daily accidents that take place on the road, or the crimes that are committed, and even in these days the international news, you would hardly believe that there is a God everywhere present. But there is. God is omnipresent. More than this, God is omnipresence. God is the all-presence and the only presence. But what good is this to mankind? What good is this to the person dying of a horrible disease or the person that is a victim of some false appetite. What good is this to uh, the people that are battling each other to stay alive? The people who are fighting to keep us from exterminating ourselves. Of what avail is the presence of God to the people who are starving in China or India? The answer is no avail. God is to no purpose so far as they are concerned. There might just as well be no God as far as they are concerned, for they certainly are not benefiting by God's presence. They are not receiving the gift of God, the grace of God, the protection of God, the food of God. They are not receiving the healing of God that the Master came to proclaim to all nations. Now, can this be remedied? Can this be changed? Is it possible to bring the presence of God to individuals, to collective bodies, and finally to the whole world? Or is this a dream? Is the teaching of the Master wrong in indicating that the kingdom of God must come on earth and will eventually come on earth? Is this wrong? Are we being deceived in having faith that God has it within his power to give us freedom, joy, harmony, completeness, health. Now, the answer is fortunately already established so that no one today needs to seek proof of it and no one needs to give proof of it. It is so well established on all continents that there are not only individuals, but groups of individuals numbering into the hundreds of thousands who are receiving the grace of God, the health of God, the protection of God, the supply of God. It would be possible, and this incidentally has been checked, to discover how many hundreds of thousands of households 
have not used any medicines for periods of two to twenty years or thirty years? Or how many households have never had in it a juvenile delinquent? Or how many households have never known the accidents or the crimes of the masses of mankind? And then you will find as you investigate that in these particular homes there has been this actual experience or awareness of the God presence which has acted as protection, as supply, as health, as healing. So that it is far too late in history to go out into the world to prove that which is so well proven that now almost all of the Protestant churches in the world are seeking how to bring the subject of spiritual healing within their own activities. Now then, the question then that arises is not is this true, but we have had 90 years of proof. The question is, how can I bring it into my experience or my family's experience? How can I make this presence of God practical in my life? Now the answer is not just one. There is not just one answer to this. Because there is an answer for the Hebrew, for the Christian, for the Oriental. There is an answer for those even who have no particular religious affiliation. And the answer in every case is the same. This realization this awareness of God is the answer. You have to acknowledge that there is only one God. You have to start with the understanding that there is not a Protestant God and a Catholic God and a Hebrew God. Each one of these religions may have their own concepts of God, but they certainly can't each have their own God. And it would be kind of ludicrous to say that uh, only one of them has God and all the rest has nothing because now you do away with omnipresence and uh, you have God channeled over here in one particular corner of the world. God is and God is omnipresence and God is one. We may entertain as many concepts of God as we choose but we cannot change the fact that if there is a God at all, there can only be one God. And that God must be infinite, it must be omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, or it cannot have the title, the name God. The very word God has to denote omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. Many teachings and many teachers have had revealed to them and within them particular paths or approaches to God realization. The infinite way also has one. And this one is based entirely on the attaining of some measure of spiritual consciousness. This teaching says that nobody can enter spiritual awareness through intellectual knowledge. That the whole of the God experience is a transcendental experience 
and one that can only be attained through some measure of a spiritual faculty. In other words, when it is said, have that mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, it is not talking about having merely a mind that has read books, but have a mind that has gone beyond what is revealed in books, a mind that has attained an inner awareness, an inner feel, an inner experience of that which is beyond human reason, that which is beyond the ability of a human to grasp. Now, no one has ever been able to explain God or show forth God as having an academic knowledge of what God is, and yet there have been countless thousands who have experienced God. In the same way then, while we may know the nature of God, so far no one has had the temerity to say, this is God. But the nature of God we may know. And one of the facets of the infinite way teaching is that by knowing the nature of God, you develop that very spiritual consciousness that we seek, that very transcendental consciousness, fourth dimensional consciousness, call it what you will, most of the time it is described as Christ consciousness or spiritual consciousness. It is to be attained, it is to be attained through study and practice because the study and practice may lead us beyond the letter of truth into the spirit. And it is uh, recorded in scripture that the letter killeth. It is the spirit that really giveth life. So it is that if we were to depend only on our knowledge of truth, we would have something which would not fulfill itself in the spirit, but if we have the knowledge of truth and keep looking toward going beyond the knowledge into the spirit, we may attain it. And our work consists of that practicing with the scriptural passages, practicing truth, practicing the presence of God, until we rise above this knowledge of truth into the actual experience itself. Once the experience has been attained, then it is very much like Paul revealed to us, I live yet not I. Christ liveth. Christ. In other words, there is a spirit in man that lives his life. The writer Saroyan made a statement or wrote in an article a few years ago that at this time I find I am not living my own life. God is living my life and I go along for the ride. And that pretty well describes what happens when an individual has attained some measure of this experience and realizes that something else is living his life and he's just following along in the footsteps. We also read that to know him aright is life eternal. To know him aright. Why is that word aright in there? Because ordinarily we do not know him aright. We have concepts of God which have been presented to us and most of them erroneous. 
It is only three months ago that a bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United States wrote in a magazine article that the God that most Hebrews and Christians worship is as inadequate as the God the atheists deny. In other words, we do not yet have the right concept of God. We do not have a high enough estimate, knowledge, of the actual God presence. And why? Because of concepts that we have drawn from sometimes within our home, sometimes within our church. No one has intentionally set about deceiving us, but we certainly have drawn wrong impressions. And therefore, one of the starting points in our work is that of trying to understand him aright. Very often we start with one word, omniscience. Omniscience meaning all knowledge, all wisdom. And let us see if we really entertain that knowledge of God as omniscience. Let us see if we ourselves have wholly accepted that God is all knowledge, all wisdom. Have we at any time asked God for anything? Prayed to God for anything? If we have we have not accepted God as omniscience because we have set ourselves up as knowing more than God. Here, God, I'm coming to you. Now, you don't know what I need, so I'm telling you. Probably you don't even know when I need it, so I'll let you know that my rent is due next Saturday. I must have this so-and-so next Saturday or latest by the first of the month. Why am I telling you this? I'm sure you don't know it. Or God, heal my child. Why am I saying this to you, God? I'm sure you don't know that my child is sick. So I am telling you. Not only that, very often I even tell you what is wrong with my child. In other words, most of our praying has been with the attitude that we are telling God of some need that we have that presumably God doesn't know, which if God were omniscience, God would know. Therefore, in our work, one of the first disciplines is to take ourselves to God with the realization, I need not tell you why I'm coming to you. I need not ask you for what I think I need. As a matter of fact, how often have I seen people get the very thing they wanted and then pray hard that it be taken away from them. How are we to know our needs better than God knows our needs? We are told in Scripture that God knoweth our needs before we do. We are told in Scripture it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are told in Scripture, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink or with wherewithal ye shall be clothed. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But this has not stopped us from denying God's omniscience. You will be surprised at what happens to your own spiritual development when you accept an all-knowing God. 
and change the nature of your prayer so that you do not try to tell God something God doesn't know or ask for something that you know you need but evidently God doesn't. In other words, watch what happens to your own spiritual development when you accept that God is omniscience. The uh, all-knowing wisdom, the all-knowing mind, the all-knowing intelligence that knoweth my need before I do. For this enables us to go to God more in this way. Here I am, Father, to be in thy presence to commune with thee, to assure myself of thy wisdom, understanding, to bring myself consciously to thy presence, knowing that thou knowest my need, and that it is thy good pleasure to fulfill my need. Not necessarily the need of what I think I want. Not necessarily the thing I think I ought to have. No, but trusting omniscience, trusting this all-knowing mind, I come here in full faith, confidence and reliance that my needs, my actual needs are known and supplied. And therefore, I am here for the joy of thy presence. There is another word, omnipotence. Now, it must be indeed a very rare person in the world who has actually accepted God as omnipotence. The word means all power, all power. To accept God as all power would change our whole nature overnight. Because if we could accept the God of all power, would there be any possibility a fearing man whose breath is in his nostril, a fearing any condition on earth, would there ever be the possibility of fear? Whether up in a plane or down in a submarine or walking the streets or driving the automobile or even being at the battlefront, would there be fear if we truly accepted God as omnipotence, the all power and the only power, what would there be left to fear? Now Jesus attained this in its fullness because all of his healing works were based on it. There is no record that he prayed to God to heal anyone. The record shows that in the presence of disease he would more nearly say, What did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. In other words, indicating there is no power to this condition. To Pilate, thou couldst have no power over me unless it was given thee of God. When we accept, even intellectually, and that's long before we have the actual realization, but even if we could accept intellectually that God is omnipotence, that beside God there is no other power, that nothing on earth or beneath the earth has power but God, God being spirit, this would really mean that only spirit is power. There could then be no power in material conditions or mental conditions, the only power there would be would be in spirit. Now, surprising as it may seem, 
to those who have not disciplined themselves along this line a transformation takes place in the consciousness of any individual who will accept the idea of omnipotence in his uh, prayers. In other words, to go to God in this wise. I am not coming to God for any power to be used over anything or anybody because I'm recognized that God is omnipotence. God is the only power. God is all the power there is. Therefore, Father, I am coming into thy presence in the assurance of omnipotence. I am coming to acknowledge. Ah, there's the word. Acknowledge him in all thy ways and he will give thee rest, peace. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Acknowledge him as omnipotence. And watch your prayer now. Father, I have not come to tell you anything because thou art omniscience, the all-knowing, he who already knows. I am not coming to you for any power. I'm not seeking any power for any purpose, no power to use, no power to wield. For thou art omnipotence, the all power, and beside thee there is no other power. Therefore I have come to this moment of prayer to acknowledge thee as omniscience, all wisdom, omnipotence, all power, and to rest in this word, to rest in thy wisdom and thy power to rest in the understanding of thy grace. There is another word, omnipresence. All presence. Have we accepted God as all presence? Hardly. To some extent, we may have accepted God as omnipresence intellectually, and to some extent, we may even be trying to accept God as omnipresence, but we have much further to go because ultimately, we must actually acknowledge that the presence of God is here where I am. Now, you know, the acknowledgement of that would be the end of prayer. Because if God is here where I am, what do I need beside God? Do I need anything or anyone else? If I have God, if God is omnipresent where I am, if the place whereon I stand is holy ground because God is here, what do I need beside that? Ah, yes, but I haven't been able to accept that fully, and therefore I am accepting the presence of sin here, the presence of disease there, the presence of a dictator here, the presence of danger here, the presence of a drunken driver on the road over here. Ah, I have a lot of disciplining to do before I really can step out in life and say, God is omnipresence. Here where I am, God is, whether up or down, in or out, where I am, God is. In other words, I must first fulfill scripture. If you mount up to heaven, God is there. If you make your bed in hell, God is there. If you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is there. But have we accepted that? Of course we haven't. If we had accepted that, 
We wouldn't be seeking God. We wouldn't be seeking a spiritual teaching. We would be living in it. It is only because we still entertain a belief that there are places where God is not, that there are people where the presence of God is not, that we are still trying to attain spiritual consciousness. For when we have attained it, it means we have attained the actual inner conviction or realization that here where I am, God is. And it makes no difference whether I'm up in a plane or down in a submarine. It makes no difference whether I'm in health or in sickness. It makes no difference where I am once I have attained Paul's conviction that neither life nor death can separate me from the love of God. Once we have attained that, we have attained that spiritual or Christ consciousness, which is a state of consciousness that neither hates, fears, nor loves error in any form, evil in any form. When we come to where Jesus was, even in some degree, and no longer fear, hate, or love evil, but recognize it as the nothingness that it really is, then we have attained our goal of God awareness. Now our prayer can be, Thy grace is my sufficiency in all things. Now when we pray, we can really speak within ourselves remembering that the kingdom of God is within us. I am here in prayer, communion with thee. I am here to tabernacle with thee, to be in thy presence. I am, in he I am here to affirm again, to acknowledge again, that thou art the wisdom of this universe, the intelligence that created it and maintains it and sustains it, that thou art that which has formed me in thy image and likeness. Because thou art the infinite wisdom, I need take no thought for my life, but rest, abide in this word, thou art my wisdom, thou art the all-knowing. And I'm here also to acknowledge omnipotence. Thou art the all-power, here where I am, within me. Thou art the all-power, and beside thee there is no other power. That is why I do not come to you, Father, for power or seeking a power. For there are no powers on earth. Thou art the only power. Thou maintainest my way. I need not fear what man can do to me. I need not put my faith in princes. I need take no thought for man whose breath is in his nostril. For thou art the way Thou art my way. Thou art the power, the allness that governs. I acknowledge too thy presence, omnipresence, that where I am thou art, that I am forever in thy presence regardless of appearances. I am in thee and thou art in me. We are one. In thy presence is fullness of life, fullness of joy, fullness of peace, 
fullness of harmony in thy presence and there is no place where thy presence is not here where I am though it be heaven or hell to mortal sense here where I am thou art I am in thy presence thy presence is with me thy presence goes with me and thy presence goes before me to make the crooked places straight thy present walks be, presence walks beside me thy presence is behind me thou art omnipresence within me and without before me and behind me and beside me for thou art omnipresence I live and move and have my being in thy presence and thy presence is my fortress thy presence is the rock upon which I am founded thy presence is my abiding place and thy presence is here where I am I do not ask it beg it plead for it or I acknowledge but even before I ask thou hearest my call I know that thou art this all-knowing this all-powerful this all-presence where I am thou art and where thou art I am for we are one God the Father God the Son one one infinite spiritual being one infinite spiritual life one infinite spiritual presence ah do you see what happens to our prayer and our communion once we have accepted that we do not have to tell God that we do not have to use God that we ourselves are living and moving and having our being in God in God's awareness in God's keeping now all of this is true and all of this is true about every individual on the face of the earth but all of this is not being experienced by all of those on the earth and the reason is again if uh, you can see scripture as I do the master says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free in other words the secret is in ye shall know the truth the secret isn't that because this is truth everybody benefits by it the secret is ye shall know the truth and the master made this very clear not only in that passage but in the 15th chapter of John his great passage when he tells us that if we abide in this word if we let this abide in us we will bear fruit richly but if we do not abide if we do not keep this word in us we will be as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth it dies and therefore the whole secret of harmonious joyous living is in knowing the truth ah but be sure it is the truth be sure you the truth you are knowing is God's omniscience not man's God's omnipotence not the power of uh, temporalities not the power of governments or the power of money or the power of uh, anything man shall not live by bread alone but by every word be sure that the truth you are knowing is the truth about God then you will find that in knowing this truth you will bear fruit richly you will abide in his grace 
the moment you wander away from it and start to act as if you knew more than God or as if God was some great power that you had to call upon to do something to other powers you're no longer knowing the truth remember I am speaking from the standpoint of the truth as it has been revealed to us in the master's teaching the teaching of Christ Jesus I am accepting the experience the revelation of Christ as truth in every single way in which it is presented that God is infinite that beside God there is nothing else that God is the all-knowing that God is the omnipotent that God is the all-presence throughout this revelation you will find that as we turn to the Father within them in that acknowledgement we discover a passage of John's that may for a long while remain unclear to us at least I'm speaking from my own experience and that passage is that God is love this uh, baffled me for a long time until I realized that I was judging by appearances then came this revelation just as God is omniscience an omnipotence an omnipresence it is literally true God is love and because God is love it is impossible for anyone living in the awareness of this truth to be outside of love's government and care God's government of us is a loving one when we are one with the vine when we are abiding in the word God's government is love fulfilling itself to the fullest degree when we are abiding in this truth God's love can no more be experienced when we are outside the kingdom or outside that oneness with the vine than God's omnipotence or God's omniscience or God's omnipresence God is love and that love is so evident when we have even grasped a tiny measure of realization of the nature of God knowing him aright knowing him as omniscience omnipotence omnipresence coming into communion with him in thankfulness and in joy and only for the purpose of this communion and acknowledgement seeking nothing because our Heavenly Father knoweth our need before we do before we can ask the truths that are set before us in our writings in our recordings in our study of scripture in our monthly letter have for their purpose the developing in us of this consciousness of God so that we can walk up and down the earth in the absolute assurance that where I am God is in the assurance of the promise son thou art ever with me all that I have is thine not by might not by power but by my spirit by grace 
Thy grace is my sufficiency. So you see that when we come together, whether we come together as some groups do now to study the monthly letter when it first reaches us, or whether we come together to hear a tape or learn what is on a tape, or in classes, the goal is always the same, to find in what we read or hear some passage or some passages that will remind us that we have temporarily forgotten omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, love. And it sets us back again so that when we walk out of the meeting, we again have some passage of assurance or reassurance. We have some truth to cling to until the day that that actual experience comes which holds us in it forever and then we start sharing it with those who, like we have been, have been separate and apart from this inner awareness, this inner glow, this inner life. You know, when it is promised that I will never leave you nor forsake you, that I will be with you to the end of the world, fear not. You must know that there is reality in those promises. You must know that that is an absolute promise of perpetual harmony for us. And then, in the degree that we are not experiencing that divine harmony which would be ours if that I within us, that presence within us were realized, it points out the way for our future work. It points out that we need further study, further enlightenment, further clinging to these truths, knowing these truths, until these truths have had the opportunity of making us free. To believe for a moment that truth is going to make us free without our knowing the truth, without our abiding in the word of God, is to go against, really, that which has been known to the mystics of all times. There was a time when Moses taught his people to have it in their forehead and bind it on their arm and even uh, have a place at the gateway of their home for the word of God. So that if we looked in the mirror, it was here. If we undressed or touched ourselves, it was here. If we entered our home, it was on the gate. In other words, the word of God was to be kept in front of us continuously so that wherever we were, whatever circumstance, we would not let the word of God escape us. And again we are given that in the 91st Psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, none of these evils will come nigh his dwelling place. But remember the price. He that dwelleth, he that lives, in this truth. Live and move and have your being in him. And the 15th chapter of John, if you abide in this word, if you abide in me, if you let me abide in you, if you let this word abide in you, then, 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 you bear fruit Richly does your life show forth the harmony of God's grace, God's peace. And of course, in proportion as that happens to you, it influences those about you. This really is one of the great lessons that we are learning. That as fast as an individual attain some measure of this awareness of God, he begins or she begins to be an influence 
to someone close by. It may be a relative, a friend, business associate, but someone is quickly benefited by the light that that one has attained. As you go on, you find that individuals who attain some measure of light are a tremendous influence in their homes for good, for harmony, for peace. Then, that eventually they draw onto themselves others. And the first, you know, there is a group around them benefiting by their consciousness. And eventually that group is lifted up to that consciousness and they begin to be an influence in their homes, in their business, in their communities. And so it is that it has been written that ten righteous men can save a city. So it is that we have discovered in actual life that one individual in a business can change the nature of that business. One individual spiritually enlightened or illumined. One individual in a home can really make it a paradise. One individual in a group can lift that group up to themselves but are the great wisdom, the great joy, the great satisfaction comes when you see an entire group of people who through their study, their practice, their living in the Word have received some measure of this consciousness and then watch the influence that they are in the many homes, in the communities, in all life about them. You will soon learn that when an individual attains some measure of the grace of God, that it isn't for them that they have received it. It is that they may be the instrument through which others may receive that grace. The Master had it. Through him the disciples received some measure of it and the apostles and for 300 years that light traveled long distance carrying with it healings, harmony, peace, joy, happy relationships. So you will discover in this age already wherever an individual has attained some measure of light his or her influence is tremendous, first in their own circle, and then wider and wider and wider, until you find them covering whole cities, whole communities, whole states, whole continents, and being a light and a peace unto others. Our first responsibility is to ourselves in the sense that until we ourselves have a realization of this omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and God is love, until we have some measure of it, it would be better to keep our fingers on our lips and say nothing about our studies then as it begins to be evident that we have attained some measure of it and our influence is felt, then we can begin to share it with others. And we ourselves have no control over the extent of the circle that we will reach. That also is something by grace. No one knows when they are touched by the Spirit of God in what way they will be called to serve. But one thing is certain, and this I've witnessed for many, many years, no one ever receives this light merely for themselves. I have never known anyone to receive this light and be able to go away and hide it somewhere. Always it is called forth in the use of the Master on earth. There remains very little for me to say to you except to try to express in a measure 
the joy that I have had here on this visit. As you know, it is the third visit. And on the first two visits, some of you became interested in this message. Some few of you derived benefits from it. And because of that, well, we have you here now. And uh, so it will be, whatever takes place in the experience of the infinite way in your city or your country will depend not on me, but on you. Whatever degree of spiritual light you attain will attract to you others about you wanting the same. And so it will be that in proportion to your spiritual development will be the blessing that you can bestow in your community, in your household, in your nation, and eventually your influence can be felt worldwide. But the responsibility first is to ourselves. Receive some of the spiritual light Keep it within yourself until it becomes self-evident and then share freely. Meanwhile, I will tell you, as I have told our groups all over the world, if there is any way, any time that I can serve you or be of help, individually or collectively, you need only write me. Fortunately, every month, our monthly letter tells where I am and where mail can reach me or cables and as some of you have discovered it is my joy to answer to serve and as a matter of fact that is the only reason I am on earth thank you thank you for all of the joy I've had here with you